for joining us here at Mount Zion Tabernacle in Silver Springs, New York. We pray that your time with us will be one saturated with the presence of God, that you will be blessed and encouraged, and that you will also uh, give worship unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's not Easter Sunday. It's the Thursday after Easter Sunday, but he's still alive. He is still in control, and we're so thankful for that. We have a special uh, lineup, I guess, for tonight. We've We've uh, brought in some special uh, music and a special speaker. Um, one of my, I call them my kids, that I've youth, youth pastored in the past. Um, and he'll introduce himself coming up here in a little bit. But let's worship together uh, with my wife and myself. Praise the Lord. Do it without 
the Lord. Let's pray together. I want you to remember, church family, there's several. Let's remember one another here in the Mount Zion circle, uh, the family of God. Let's pray for one another. But let's also pray uh, for Nathan Embry's wife, Carrie. Uh, she is still recovering. We're praying and believing for a complete healing and recovery in her situation let's remember this world this nation let's pray that god will use this uh, to bring many in many in to his kingdom uh, i i would love when all this is uh passed and we come back to whatever our new normal will be that churches are filled with people that are grateful uh, not, not that are hateful, but they're grateful for what God has done. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together, church. Lord, we love you. God, we're so grateful for you. Thank you, Jesus, for how you've kept your hand on us, Lord. God, thank you, Lord, that we can have confidence and faith in you. God, knowing, Lord, that all things work together for good. Somehow, some way. This is working together for the good of them that are, uh, are called according to your purpose, them that love you. God, I pray, Lord, that you will give us an unshakable confidence in that. Lord, for Sister Embry, God, right now, we pray that you would touch her, her brain, God, her body. Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, that you would heal. God, you are not limited as we are. God, we might not be able to lay hands on her right now and anoint her with oil but god you can send the word only and it will be done god would you do that in the name of jesus for brother nathan and their babies their family god i pray that you will touch them encourage them god give them a peace that passes all understanding during this time lord let them feel that strengthening presence of god that is all around them let their eyes be open, God, that they might see that there are more for them than there are against them in the name of Jesus. God, for our president, God, both uh, Senate, Congress, Lord, those in leadership uh, over health organizations, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of evil men, Lord, God, that you would turn the hearts, Lord, of those that that, uh, that shake their fist in your face, God, and that you would humble them, Lord, and allow them to come to a place of repentance. God, for our state government, Lord, local government, Lord, I pray that you would protect and keep them. God, our, our first responders, essential employees across this nation and the world, God, touch them, help them. Lord, for those that are sick, would you touch? God, move in each case. For God, Though you are the God of the universe, you are also the God of the individual. God, touch in the name of Jesus. God, those that are dealing with losses, there have been many. But God, you are the God of all comfort. God, would you comfort them, God, and help them through this time. Lord, move in the remainder of the service. God, as we worship together, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's worship with the Straczynski family as they sing. God bless you. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him. The final breath He gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. Battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting?
Church. This is Brother Thomas Ramey from Lorraine, Ohio, and I want to thank you for this opportunity, Brother Jeremy Penson, for allowing me to minister in your midweek service um, on your broadcast on YouTube. Uh, greetings to everybody that is watching and who may be watching, who may watch this later on. Uh, I pray that you would find encouragement and strength throughout this sermon, uh, throughout this little lesson that I am to give. Um, I was called to preach at 15, and I began to preach when I was 18 after I finished up Bible college there uh, at uh, OBI, and the Lord began to direct my life to dig deeper into the Word of the Lord and the ministry, and I have now been preaching for about, I would say, uh, about eight or nine years now, and I just want to thank the Lord for this opportunity. It is a privilege and an honor to do this, and uh, so if you would like to turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 15 and through 18. This is what the Bible says, real quick. And even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. And nevertheless, when it shall turn unto the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Spirit of the Lord, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Uh, today, I want to talk about the revealing power of refocusing. The revealing power of refocusing. Hey Amen. I was uh, reading the scripture just a few weeks ago, and um, I was kind of a little disheartened and broken uh, at the current situation of what is happening in this nation, uh, even in the world. There's a global pandemic with the coronavirus happening right now. And unfortunately, it's not only impacting... Um, just the physical body, but even the mental body, even the mental mind of the person. And um, it's shutting down our economy. Businesses are closing. Churches are having to close. Um, even grocery stores are only limiting their hours and limiting the amount of people that can go in at a time. Uh, we're living in troubling times and dangerous times. Uh, we're hearing different conflicting stories of news articles and rumors and uh, speculations and even conspiracies that are coming out on how this was caused and why this was caused, if there's a cure, if there's not a cure, or what to do. The stimulus plan was put into effect, was signed and, and given out, and it's still not really out there yet. It's still being processed, I guess, and many people are waiting for that $1,200 check. Some people are on employment. Um, but the point is, a lot of us are living in fear, unfortunately. If you look at the world, if you look at everything that is happening around us, you get on your social media, you find nothing but fear controlling people. Amen. It's not only affecting those that aren't believers, but it's affecting the Christians, the ones that call themselves disciples and followers of Christ. Amen. They're losing their focus on the Lord. They're losing their focus on everything that He has called us to do. They're fighting amongst each other. They're, they're, they're bickering and complaining because one is opening their doors while the other is closing their doors. But friend, I want to tell you, now is not the time to get distracted. Now is not the time to lose our focus on the Lord. But now is the time, more so than ever, to be looking up for our redemption draweth nigh. Everything that is happening right now is said in Scripture. The Bible says that we will expect pandemics. We will expect pestilence. And we will expect earthquakes in diverse places. There will be wars and rumors of wars. And this is just setting up for one world government. This is setting up for the revealing of the Antichrist. And despite of where he may come and when he may come, friend, I want to tell you, we don't know when the Lord comes. 
The Bible says that we must be attentive and looking unto him at all times. We cannot lose our focus. We cannot allow the enemy to steal our minds, but we have to look toward Jesus. Amen. And so I want to talk to you today about the revealing power of refocusing. Amen. In that scripture that I read to you, it says this, that there is a veil that was covering our hearts. There was a veil that was covering the hearts of those that in the day of Moses. And the Bible says this, that nevertheless, that when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, what does it mean when it says that the veil shall be taken away? Well, what is a veil? In the biblical sense, the veil means a covering or covering up. It means that there was something upon their hearts that was covering their hearts where they could not understand the truth, where they were maybe too pessimistic. Maybe they didn't have the faith. Maybe they just had... Um, uh, uncertainty in their minds. Well, uh, who cares about this God, man? Who cares about knowing him? But the Bible says this, that when their heart, when it turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Friend, we don't have to understand everything. We don't have to know everything. It's impossible. We're finite. We can't understand all the things of God that there is. But he did tell us that if we will trust in him, that he will show us and he will direct us and he will comfort us and he will lead us all the way into the end. Amen. But there is a veil upon the hearts of the people today in this nation. There is a veil upon a lot of believers. And, and maybe it's not specifically a veil of, of sin, but maybe it's a, a veil of sin, uh, of uh, the sin of doubt. Maybe it's a veil of fear. Maybe it's a veil of anxiety or of stress. Or maybe it's a, a, a veil of uncertainty. There is a veil that covers the heart of men. Hey Amen. I, I was once in that position in my own life, in my own mind. I remember uh, just about a year and a half ago, I was struggling with uh, depression and with suicidal thoughts. And um, I remember I was just battling all the time. And I remember going to this conference in Tennessee called Pentecost again. And I remember the preacher was preaching. And I remember just during that sermon, I felt the Lord directed me and drawn me to the altar. And I ran to that altar as fast as I could. And I lifted my hands in worship. And I said, Lord, if you'll take this from me, if you'll deliver me from this mental illness, this depression, this suicidal thought that is plaguing my mind right now, I know, Lord, that I, I will use this as a testimony and glorify your name through it. And in that moment, within just a matter of moments, I remember the Lord showed me a vision of him reaching down into my mind. And as he reached down in my mind, the enemy had put a, a uh, control box there that would reveal thoughts of lust, thoughts of fear and worry and suicidal thoughts in my mind, demonic thoughts, things that were not of God. And I began to pray, Lord, would you deliver me from this? And I remember seeing the Lord reach his hand down from heaven, rip that control box out and to begin to rewire my brain and to fix that issue. And I'm telling you, friends, today, I have never gone back. Amen. I have been completely free for about two years now, almost two years. But I want to say that it took me to turn to the Lord to realize I needed that. Amen. Uh, there was a veil on my heart. There was a veil on my mind that where I was distracted. I was focusing on, on others' ministry. I was focusing, well, I'll never be as effective as them. I'll never have as big as a ministry as them. I'll never be as important in the kingdom of God as them. But God began to deal with my heart. And he began to, to, to take those thoughts from me. And he gave me the thoughts of him. He gave me the mindset of Jesus. And now I have been free and delivered from that for a long time now. But there was a veil over my heart. And I remember as 10 years old, there was a veil over my heart. I was a sinner and I needed God. I mean, I remember running to that altar at Camp Blessing and I was 10 and I knelt there and I didn't really understand, but I knew I needed God. Amen. And I began to cry out to the Lord and he saved my soul at 10 years old at the altar. Uh, parents, I want to remind you, your babies, as, as young as they may be, they can still be saved. Amen. You just got to train them up right. Amen. And I was uh, 10 years old and I ran to that altar and I began to weep and to cry and the Lord saved me. But greater than that, he even filled me with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So he took that veil away from me, that covering that was over my heart. But there's a passage of scripture. There's a story of the Bible that I want to focus on here for just the next few minutes. And if you go to your Bibles with me to chapter 14 of Matthew, in verses 22 through 33, it shows us the story of the disciples. And Jesus was speaking unto the disciples, and he told the disciples, he said, We will go to the other side. But Jesus stayed behind while the disciples went out into the middle of the sea on their boat. And when Jesus was staying behind praying, and the disciples were out in that boat in the middle of the sea, the Bible says that there came a storm. 
and the winds were boisterous, and the waves began to crash around it. And the Bible says that they grew in fear for their lives. They were in fear for their lives, and that's exactly what's happening right now with this pandemic. Amen. With the coronavirus going around, many people are living in fear. They're living with stress and anxiety, and they're believing that they're going to die if they do this or that. Uh, I believe that there is a spirit of fear controlling uh, this nation, controlling the world, and I believe this is all leading up to the Antichrist. This is all leading up to a one world government. Amen. I believe that the Bible tells us this. It says that there will be pandemics, there will be pestilence, and there will be earthquakes in diverse places. There will be wars and rumors of wars that will take place. And all of this is, is the setting up for the second return of Jesus to snatch, snatch his church and take him back home with him. Amen. But I'm telling you, friends, we cannot focus on the negative and on the bad that is happening around us. Because if we do and we lose our focus on the Lord, we become like the disciples. We grow in fear for our lives. We grow in, in fear and believe that we're going to die. We're going to grow in hopelessness and we're going to grow in depression. We're going to grow in anxiety and stress and not uh, know how things are going to happen and how things are going to end. But friend, all we have to do is trust in the Lord. Amen. The disciples were in fear. But Jesus said this to them. He said, don't be afraid, be of good cheer, for it is I. It is me, it is the Lord. I'm here, I am with you. And in that moment, I believe that the disciples weren't sure to believe because the Bible says that they thought it was a spirit that was talking to them. And Peter speaks up and he says, Lord, if it be you, then bid me out to come onto the water with you. And so the Lord says, come. And he bid them out to come. And now, I would imagine for a moment as I'm the other disciples looking at Peter walking on the water, I would think, wow, what an astounding miracle that is taking place in front of us. The only other mortal man to ever walk on water was him. Amen. It was Peter, the only man to ever do that outside of Jesus. And as Peter is walking towards Jesus, the Bible says this, as he's looking at the Lord, he was able to walk on that water. But then the winds got boisterous again and the storm was raging. And the Bible says that Peter begin to drown because of that. He began to turn his focus on the storm. He began to turn his focus on worry, on fear. He grew afraid and he was drowning. He was drowning in that sea. He was drowning in hopelessness. He was drowning in fear. And all of a sudden, the Bible says this about Peter. Peter cried out to the Lord. Amen. Peter cried out to the Lord for salvation, for rescue. Amen. Friend, that's what it's going to take for us to come through this thing. We have to cry out to the Lord for mercy and for rescue. Amen. I was reading an article just a little bit ago, just a little while back, and it was saying that the divorce rate is up. It was saying that the suicide rate is up. Alcoholism and drug addiction is up in the, just the last few years. I mean, it is skyrocketing. And, and, and people my age and even older, it is just going higher and higher almost every day. Amen. More people are taking their lives because they're drowning in a sense of hopelessness. Hopelessness. Many people are turning to the pill or the bottle because they feel that there's just no escape. I've talked to many of uh, colleagues and friends and peers, and I asked them, why is it that you, you take drugs? Why is it that you drink so much? Why is it that you do this or you do that? And they tell me this, because it's an escape. Amen. That breaks my heart to know that they turn to sin to find the escape when I have the answer, and his name is Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Alcohol won't do it. The pill won't do it. Cutting yourself won't do it. Suicide won't do it. Nothing else will give you that joy and that peace of mind like Jesus can. He can deliver you. He can set you free. Don't be like Peter and look at the bad that has happened to you. Don't look at your past as, as, it, uh, as it will always be like this. Don't think like that. But I'm telling you, if you will turn your mind unto the Lord, he can rescue you. He can save you. He can deliver you. The Bible says that when we turn unto him, behold, all things are new and old things are passed away. Amen. You don't have to go back to that old lifestyle. You don't have to go back to your drug addiction, your alcoholism. You don't have to go back to your porn addiction. You don't have to go back to that lust. You don't have to go back to that thieving way, that lying way. You can be free and free indeed. He whom the Son sets free is truly free indeed. Amen. If you would be like Peter, and even though you might be drowning, you might be a backslider. 
backslider right now. You may be drowning in, in fear and depression. You may feel hopeless because you lost your job. You lost your finances. You lost your home. You've lost everything. You don't know where to turn, friend. Turn unto the Lord. Be like Peter and cry out to the Lord. I also want to point out that the Lord's response during the time of Peter's crisis, when Peter was crying, he cried out and he said, Lord, save me. And the Bible says that immediately the Lord reached out his hand and grabbed Peter. Amen. He grabbed Peter and pulled him out of that water. Friend, I'm here to tell you that the Lord does not hesitate in rescuing you. He doesn't hesitate in pouring out his mercy. He doesn't hesitate in pouring out his grace. He doesn't hesitate in pouring out his love upon you. The Bible says that he was willing to go to that cross for you and I. He didn't hesitate. He didn't argue. He didn't bicker or complain. He didn't even try to bargain with God or bargain with the enemy. He knew what he had to do to rescue us, and that's exactly what he'll do for you and I. If we will just take the time to come to him and to ask him, Lord, would you rescue me? Lord, would you come to my rescue? Would you bring me out of this? Would you deliver me? And the Bible says that he delights in delivering his people. Amen. He delights because he knows that he'll get the glory from it. Friend, let me tell you something. When you cry out to the Lord, don't cry out in arrogance. Don't cry out in selfishness, but cry out in humility such as Peter did. Cry out and know that he is the author and the finisher of your faith. The story is not over until he says it's over. He is the author. That means that he holds the pen and he is the finisher. That means that he, when he's done, he'll close the book. Friend, it is not over until he says that it is over. You're not too far gone. You're not too hopeless. You're not too much far down into that water of drowning and hopelessness and fear and stress, but you can be rescued if you just call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to rescue you. The Bible says that there is no temptation coming to man, but such is common to him. Amen. There's temptations that come to all of us. There's things that we are all persuaded to go after, but I'm telling you, but the Bible says this, that there is a way of escape. He made a way of escape on Calvary when he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. When he went so willingly, knowing that we would oftentimes reject him, knowing that oftentimes we wouldn't pray, we wouldn't worship, we wouldn't go to church, we wouldn't read our Bibles, but he died for us knowing that he would rescue our souls if we would just call out to him. He died for us because he loved us so much. Friend, don't think any other. His word is true and it is fact and it is infallible. No man can persuade me any other way. I have come too far and I'm sure many of you have come too far to be told otherwise. He loves you so much that he is willing to pull you out of anything that you find yourself in. All you have to do is cry out to him like Peter did. Amen. And finally, I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to, to you about the disciples' revelation. Amen. In, four, in Matthew 14 of that story in 32 and 33, it says this. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen. Thou art the Son of God. Amen. My first remembrance or memory of my encounter with God when I was a child, I was five years old, and I remember being so sick, just vomiting all over the place, and the doctors had no idea what was happening. One kidney was shut down, and the other one, from what I understand, as my parents have told me, was only operating at 30-something percent. I was dying. I was on my deathbed. And I remember our, our pastor, Brother Gerald Hood, came, and he laid hands on me, and he began to pray for me. I remember that just as a small child in the hospital, him coming and praying for me. And I remember it wasn't long after that that I fully recovered and was healed from that uh, terrible sickness or disease, whatever it was that plagued my body. Amen. The Lord delivered me out of that and rescued me. And I'm here to tell you, friend, it revealed to me who he was. At even a young age, he was healer. He was already the healer to me. But even like I already testified that he was the savior at 10 years old, that when he saved my soul, I, I knew that I needed a saving. I knew that I needed a savior. And, and I didn't quite understand everything. I just knew that if I would cry out to him, he would save my soul. And so he did, but I also know him as the comforter because the Bible says that when he extended, that he sent the comforter being the Holy Ghost. At 10 years old, even when I was saved, he filled me with the Holy Ghost in that same hour. He filled me with the Holy Ghost and he gave me his comforter. And as I grew older and as I grew into my teenage years, yes, I faltered and I failed, but there was always that spirit of the Lord that would deal with my heart to come back in repentance, that would cry out to him. And now I'm 26 years old, almost 27 years old next month. 
and I have been preaching the gospel for, for over five years now, and the Lord's used me in gifts of healing and, and other gifts of the Spirit and has been doing a great work in my life. And I'm not bragging on myself, but on the goodness of the Lord. But in those moments of my life when I was struggling the most, when I didn't have a dime to my name, and I would look into my bank account, and there would be money sitting there, and I'd have no idea how I got there. There'd be times where I didn't know how I was going to pay my car payment or how I was going to buy groceries or food when I was away in the ministry school. There'd be times where I was afraid, but God would provide and it revealed to me who he was that during this crisis, amen, during the trials of our life in every area of our life, when we're hurting, when we're broken, when we're needing providing and when we're needing a, a, a deliverance on our life, God moves in those areas to reveal who he is. Amen. I, I remember as a little boy, we, we grew up poor and mom has told this story to me many a times and we had a box of macaroni and cheese sitting in the pantry, and, but we didn't have any milk or anything else to, to go with it. And I remember uh, mom was praying and she was saying, Lord, I just want food for my babies, not, not for my own self, but just food for my kids that they may be able to eat. And it wasn't just, but moments later that somebody had knocked on our door and left us a, a, a crate of food laying on our front doorstep. Amen. God had provided in a moment's time for us children. Amen. That is the re 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 revealing power of Jesus. I'm sorry, excuse me. That is the revealing power of refocusing our minds on the Lord. In those moments when we were distraught and we were broken, we had no idea how ends were going to meet. But when we cried out to the Lord and we begin to focus on his goodness and on his grace and on his mercy, God began to provide and reveal who he was to us. And that's what happened to the disciples right here. They saw Jesus walking on the water and they saw that Jesus was supreme and that God was sovereign in that moment over all nature, over all issues of life. He, they saw him raise the dead and heal the blinded eyes and open up the deaf ears and, and open, uh, open up and give strength unto the, the paralyzed. And, and he was able to do marvelous things in their sight, but they finally saw him be ruler over nature. There's another passage of scripture and story of the Bible where it says that they were on the boat and the winds and the waves were boisterous. And the Bible says that they woke him up in the stern of the ship and, he cr and they cried out for him, Jesus, what are we going to do? And he spoke unto the winds and the waves and the Bible says, and that they ceased. And the Bible says that they marveled and that they were amazed at what Jesus did for them in that moment. And they worshiped him just like the scripture I read you there in Matthew 14. And they marveled and they worshiped the Lord that had been saying, truly thou art the son of of God. Friend, he wants to reveal to you today who he is. All you got to do is trust in him. Refocus your attention on the Lord. Get your mind off of what used to be. Get your mind off the past. Get your mind off the current pandemic and focus on Jesus. Focus on the author and the finisher of your faith. And I assure you, I promise you, he'll be there at your beck and call. When you're hurting, when you're broken, all you got to do is call out to him. And so as I close... And that scripture I read as our opening text, and it says this, but, all, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that word beholding actually means this. I'm going to read you this. It says, the word behold means to perceive through sight or apprehension to gaze upon. And that word gaze means this, to steadily, intently, especially in admiration, surprise, or thought. So there in that scripture is saying, instead of saying behold, we can say to gaze into a glass of the glory of the Lord or to look into the presence or to the character of the glory of the Lord. Amen. When we begin to look at the scriptures, when we look in the word of, the God, of God and we begin to study the scriptures and focus on his character, God begins to reveal to us who he is. He begins to show us who he is. But friends, that word gaze means to steadily and intently. That means to look directly on him, not to the left and not to the right, but to look directly at the Lord. Hey man, friends, I want to tell you today that we need to put spiritual blinders on. And what I'm saying is that we need to put things on our eyes, on our spiritual mind's eye, and to be able to focus on the Lord. The enemy comes to distract us. The enemy comes to destroy us. The Bible says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is a thief that come to, to rob us of our joy, to rob us of our peace. And the Bible says this, that he does so by distracting us. Amen. In Hebrews, it tells us to lay aside every weight and sin 
that so easily besets us. Amen. If we're distracted by gossip, throw it away. If we're distracted by certain movies or videos or games or whatever it may be, throw it away. If music distracts us from a peace of mind, throw it away. If anything that is in your life that gets your mind off the Lord, throw it away in the name of Jesus. If it distracts you and it pulls you away from God, then throw it away. It is not vital to you. It will destroy you. It will get you away from the Lord and ultimately take you to a devil's hell that was never intended for you. You have to focus back on God. If you're bound by addiction, if you're bound by drugs or alcohol, if you're down by porn or lustful thoughts, if you're bound by those kinds of things, I want to tell you there is deliverance and there is freedom. I am a living testimony of that fact. I know many others are too. And friend, if you're under the sound of my voice and you've not come to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's never too late. Amen. If you feel that tugging on your heart, I don't have to beg or plead with you. You know that you know that there is a spirit moving on you, that there is something drawing you, and that you need salvation. If you would call on him, he will come and save your soul. He will deliver you from all evil. Amen. I'm so thankful for the presence of the Lord, even that I feel here in this room. And so here for the last few minutes, I just want to take the time to pray over you. I thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly whatsoever, but it is an honor and a privilege. But I want to remind you, cry out to the Lord. Amen. During our crisis, God will reveal himself and we will just learn to trust in him. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. The power, the revealing power of refocusing shows us that he is in control. If we learn to focus our mind on him, he'll take care of the rest. Amen. There's a scripture that says this, that he will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll end it here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, we praise you in advance, Lord, for all the things that you are going to do in our lives. Lord, we know that we are living in troubling times and times with uncertainty, with economic collapse, with uh, the medical field battling and struggling to take care of this virus, the coronavirus. Lord, many are living in fear and depression. The suicide rate is up. The divorce rate is up. Many are living in hopelessness and fear. But God, I declare today that your word is true. Your promises are true. And I pray that whoever is watching this right now would feel the liberty, would feel the joy of the Lord down deep in their soul as they turn to you for salvation and for rescue. Lord, your word says that you delight in showing mercy. You delight in showing grace. Lord, you delight in showing who you are. I pray, Lord, that today, right now, during this time, if they may have lost their, their, uh, their job, maybe they're losing their financial support, maybe they're losing their, their medical benefits, whatever it may be, God, I pray right now that the peace that passes all understanding would surround them, would invade their mind. And Lord, I pray that if they're plagued with suicidal thoughts, maybe they're battling depression, mental illnesses, then they don't have a cure for. Lord, I pray that the supernatural healing of God would come right now and deliver them in the name of Jesus. That spirit of fear is not of God. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, you've given us a spirit of peace and of joy and of rest and of promises that we can rest upon you, Lord. There is a promise that says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Hallelujah, Lord. We are declaring that promise today that we may be in the middle of the darkest of night, that we may be found in the middle of, of crying and of brokenness and uncertainty, but Lord, morning is coming very soon. Revival is coming very soon. I declare by the word of the Lord that all things are new, Lord. Lord, you're right now invading the heart of men and women, of children who are listening to this message, listening to this sermon, that you are coming and delivering them and bringing healing and peace of mind that they have not experienced in a very long time or maybe never at all. Lord, I pray, let your divine and supernatural spirit go to them right where they're at under the sound of my voice and let them feel the joy of the Lord once again. Hallelujah, Lord. We pray for this nation. We pray for our political leaders. We pray for both parties and all parties involved. We pray that, Lord, that there would come a peace. We, that we pray that there come a revival, that there come a stability in the economic uh, situation, that there come a stability in our homes, that there comes a supernatural stability in our churches and a unity in our churches and in this nation like we have never seen before. God, do it. I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We magnify you, Jesus. We glorify you for all that you do. 
Amen. It's not over until you say it's over. Lord, help us to refocus our attention on you so that you may reveal what you want to do in this hour. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do and will forever glorify you and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. I hope you've been blessed. I hope you've been edified and lifted up in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I love you all. I'm praying for you all. Keep us in your prayers. And uh, I pray that you are blessed throughout the remainder of this week. Amen. God bless. Everything's going to turn out right. He said he'd never leave you in the dead of the night. So fix your eyes on the light of the sun. Don't look back. Walk on. Can't see where you're going when you hang your head. Gotta have a little faith in what the Bible says. Everything's going to work out. Everything's going to turn out right. Said he'd never leave you in the dead of the night. So fix your eyes on the light of the sun. Don't look back. Walk on. You can't see where you're going when you hang your head. Gotta have a little faith in what the Bible says. Everything's gonna work out. Everything's gonna turn out right. You'll see. Praise the Lord. Great word. Brother Thomas brought to us tonight the revealing power of refocusing. Bless me. I'm thankful that God can use times like this to get our eyes back on him. Doesn't matter if the storm's raging, if we feel covered up in fear, feel covered up in other things that we're struggling against. God can look right through a, right through the storm, rather, and he can see us where we're at. And when we cry out to him, he's just that call away. Praise the Lord. Lord willing, we will see you. Uh, at least you'll see me and my family uh, on Sunday morning. Pray that you've enjoyed tonight. A little bit different. We're going to try to uh, keep this going. I've got a couple other young men uh, from our past ministry in mind. I'm praying about that. I might have Brother Thomas back, too. He did so good tonight. So, anyways, we will see you Sunday morning. I pray that God will bless you and keep you. In the name of Jesus, be blessed.